Christmas is a reminder that our greatest need is the presence of God. We were created to live and experience the presence of God in our lives. And I can prove it to you with the passage of God's word that is on the screen in front of you. I want you to read it with me, please. This is detailing a part of the Christmas story. Before we read it, let me remind you that we have been learning the gospel names for Christ in the Christmas story. Our first Sunday of Advent, we learned from John chapter 1 that Jesus is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. Last Sunday, we learned from the text that we will read together today that his name shall be called what? Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now today, we're going to see the name that reflects the greatest gift that God could have given us his very own presence. Read it with me, will you? She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means... Say that again. God is with us. It's interesting in the Bible, you can, you can imagine the story of Emmanuel in three acts or three separate plays, if you will. The first act is God's presence in the garden. God's presence began with mankind in the garden because he created us, breathed into us the breath of life. The Bible says that Adam and Eve were able to walk in the cool of the garden and hear the voice of the Lord and walk in the presence of the Lord. So we were created to enjoy God's very company. We were designed by God to experience his own friendship, his companionship, and his presence. It's what defines us as human beings. It's what makes us different from the animal kingdom. We are created to know God, to love God, and to walk with God. But you all know the story of the garden. Adam and Eve messed up royally because they sinned. And because they sinned, God pronounced death. A just judgment was passed upon all mankind. The book of Romans says, for that all have sinned. Death was passed upon us for all have sinned. You know what that means, don't you? We can't blame Adam. We would be just as guilty if it had been Derek and April in the beginning in the garden. April would have eaten the fruit first. <laughs> and I would have said, what are you doing, wife? <laughs> I'm kidding. We, we would have done the very same thing that Adam and Eve did, so be careful about poking Adam in the eye. Because the story is here for our learning. I watch Keith Morrison, that Canadian journalist who now runs a large, uh, mel a, a nar a large crime reporting uh, news program in the U.S. now. And I watched a horrific story last night of a serial killer. Uh, it was hard to watch. But at the end of the interview, Keith Morrison said to this convicted serial killer who admitted to his heinous crimes, why did you do it? And he blames the correction officer for not watching over him when he was on parole. But we all do that. We want to blame somebody else. It's not my fault, it's his fault. It's not my fault, it's her fault. It's not my fault, it's my mother's fault. It's not... See, the Bible is very clear about the fact that we sinned and as a just judgment, God had to expel us from the garden. The glory of God's presence in the Garden of Eden was lost because of man's sin. But you need to know that the gospel begins in the garden because God temporarily expelled man from his presence in the garden so that he could be eternally welcomed back one day. God expelled man from the garden so he could begin the work of redeeming mankind and, and, and closing the breach that existed between God and man. And so the story of Eden is the story of our sin separating us from that great gift of God's wonderful presence. That's act one. Say for me, will you? That's act one. 
It was a happy time. It was a tragic time. Number two, I want you to see his presence in the Old Testament. Because even though uh, a tragic separation resulted from our sin, God still promised his presence to the nation of Israel in numerous ways. But his presence still was remote, impersonal, and by and large, inaccessible to mankind. So God didn't just damn us eternally. He separated us from his presence, then went about reminding us that the greatest gift that mankind is his very own presence in our lives. And he established his presence in miraculous ways in the Old Testament. Do you remember as the Jews were released from Egyptian slavery and were making their way across to the Holy Land, the the promised land, the land land of Canaan, that uh, God's presence led them through the wilderness in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The cloud and the fire were not significant. The presence of God is what mattered in those moments. As if God's saying, if you want to learn the significance of life, you have to learn how to follow my presence in your life. And then God, as he was teaching the people how to worship him in that state of separation from him, he gave them a religious system that allowed one man once a year to come into his presence to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, which was above the Ark of the Covenant, with his glory hovering over the Holy of Holies. So God was saying to Israel, Even though mankind has been separated from me, there is a hope that one day you will be brought back into my presence. And then, of course, if you know your story, the story of the Old Testament, you know that the crown jewel of promises in all the Old Testament was spoken by Isaiah. During a dark time in Israel's history, the Lord made this incredible promise. Therefore, the Lord will give you a sign Behold, the virgin shall conceive, and she shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. The promise fulfilled in the Christmas story is the Old Testament declaration that God said, I'm going to give you a gift, and in that gift, the breach that exists between God and man can be closed. We're enemies now, but we're going to be reconciled. It is God's promised presence coming to the earth, even in the Old Testament, that filled the hearts of all Israelites with hope and joy. By the way, the Lord promised again and again to Israel, my presence will go with you. It was still remote and inaccessible, but he promised that he would watch over his people until the great day that Emmanuel would come. Do you remember that verse in Isaiah 41, verse 10? Here's the promise of his presence. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. Yes, I will uphold you with the righteous, my righteous right arm. God is promising his presence to his people, but his presence still was inaccessible and unattainable to us. I read this promise last night and was blown away. He said to Isaiah chapter 43, listen to what he said to Israel, fear not for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So God is saying to his people, I haven't forgotten you. My presence will follow you, but we need to be reconciled. You're still tracking with me, church family? There are three acts. It's the story of God's coming to the world in the garden, the story of his promised presence to the Jews, and now thirdly, his promise in the New Testament to us. I call it the crown jewel of the Old Testament, the promise of the child that would be born on the wall over here the son that would be given. His name would be Emmanuel. And then you know, don't you, that the New Testament begins its wonderful story with a reminder that in Jesus, Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled. So with the arrival, his arrival was God saying, the long-awaited fulfillment of this promise has begun. God is no longer remote and distant, 
and only, not only can a few come into his presence, but all who wish to enter his presence may come through the child, through the son that was given as a sacred gift to the world. So with his arrival, everything changed. And I would say with his arrival, a better gift than Eden itself has arrived. Because you know that when Jesus Christ came incarnate, God incarnate in the flesh, he was closing the gap. You hear what I'm saying, church family? He was closing the gap that was tearing you apart, that was destroying your soul. The loneliness and ache in your soul is now over because of Emmanuel, the coming of Christ, the one who would reconcile us to God. But listen carefully. He didn't come just to restore the great gift of Eden. And Eden was a great gift. God is our creator. We were meant to fellowship and friendship with him. And a tragic loss happened because of our sin. But God wasn't just about getting the job done. You hear me? God had something more in mind than just getting the job done and restoring us to the pleasure of Eden. He was building a new humanity because Jesus Christ was born in a cradle in Bethlehem. He grew up and became a man and then he was crucified on a cross and he went to the grave and he resurrected. And then he made an incredible promise. I'm about to create a unique humanity that has never been seen in all of history. God is not only with us, he's in us. He promised his Holy Spirit to descend upon those who would trust Christ and he would create a spiritual bond. I would become one with the Lord by his very presence in me. Of course, he said in the Great Commission, go into all the world, you know that text, he said, and lo, I'm with you always. But it's one step greater. He's not only with me, he's above me, he's beneath me, beside me, before me, behind me, and he's living inside of me. He's created a bond with himself through the gift of his Holy Spirit. Now hold on. I can't tell if you're following me or not. Are you following me? Yes. Something greater than Eden took place when Jesus Christ sent his spirit as God's presence in the world. He's now, he's now filling us. I have been joined to the body of Christ. I'm a member of the family of God. I'm part of the universal bride of the church. I belong to Christ. But he didn't come just to create a unique humanity. He came to create a unique community. When the church gathers, we are one in Christ. And in our presence, the very presence of Jesus Christ resides. When the church comes together, there's a power released in the presence of Jesus that is not felt when you walk alone. Because God said, the church is my body. It is the expression of my own love and heart. How cool is that? We get to share in the presence of Christ. Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. What's he doing here? He wants to express his love through us. Notice, I'm, I'm not saying through me, through us. There's only one greater step than you, and that is us, being God's people. That's not the end of the story, but I'll just touch on this briefly. His presence is revealed in Eden in the Old Testament, and in our world, he arrived and promised us something greater than Eden, and he says, your ultimate destination is to dwell in my presence. I love this passage of the book of the Revelation. When I finally reach the end, see, from Eden, God has been working a plan that will come to a great consummation. And the great consummation, the eastern skies over the Mount of Olives in the city of Jerusalem will part wide open, and Jesus Christ will descend according to Zechariah chapter 14, and he will appear in his second coming to begin the end of God's program on the earth. We will move into that, that new state eventually. Listen carefully to Revelation 21. And I, here's what John said. John was given a glimpse into that day. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, 
the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. I have a foretaste of what is coming through Christ by his spirit. But one day I'm going to walk in a land where God is moving among us just like he did in the Garden of Eden. According to the promise of John. You say, anyone else say that in the New Testament? You betcha, lots of people said it in the New Testament. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall caught up, shall be caught up together to meet them in the clouds. So shall we ever be with the Lord. For every loved one that is represented in these poinsettias that we miss, I promise you on the authority of God's word, though their body was laid to rest in the earth, they are as much alive right now as they have ever been. They are rejoicing in the very presence of the God who created them, of the Savior who redeemed them, and they're simply waiting for us to get home in the end. And what is home? God's presence. Home is God's presence. So I feel at home in God's presence now, and I'm looking forward to the day when I finally make it home into his presence. Let me conclude by reminding you that he created us to live in his presence because he is a relational God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But he calls us to take responsibility for our end of the bargain. Forgive me for being so crass about the gospel. It's not up to you, it's up to him. He does ask us to take responsibility for the fact that we have sinned against him. It's good for us to take responsibility for our sin. In fact, there can be no salvation without doing it. I sinned against you, Lord. I broke your law. I'm a rebel at heart. I'm cursed with an old nature that dogs me daily, moment by moment. Be merciful to me, a sinner, and give me life. The Bible says God delights. George, God delights. Stick his hand out to sinners and say, man, come on. Let's walk together as friends. Let's enjoy each other's presence. This is God speaking. Imagine it. It's God putting his hand out to us saying, take responsibility, repent of your sin, trust Christ. And the gap, the breach is finally closed. Here's the key though. It's by invitation only. What I mean by that is God's issued the invitation and he's waiting for you to accept. God won't kick down any doors. He will not muscle his way into any life. He's not a dictator. He's a loving father. He's simply saying, I've given you the facts. I'm asking you to come. Will you accept my invitation? That's why the Bible, Jesus described himself, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens his heart, any woman opens her heart, any boy or girl or teenager, I will come in and friend with him, fellowship with him. Eat with him. It's the imagery of sharing relationship. Your heart craves relationship with God more than you could even imagine. God waits and he invites. Will you let him in? Can you hear him saying, come on, what you waiting for? Cross the divide now. Trust Christ. Just simply say, I accept, Lord. I'm sorry for my sin and I receive Jesus as my Savior. Would you let me pray for you just as we conclude? This would be a great way to conclude this sermon by asking you, will you open your heart? Will you pray that prayer? Talk to God from your heart. Tell Jesus you trust him and you receive him and you take his offer of the forgiveness of sins and of reconciling you with God. And in that moment, the Bible says a great miracle has transpired. The miracle of the new birth, the miracle of eternal life, has been deposited in your heart. Father, I pray that your spirit will cast the net and reap the harvest of the work you've already done. I'm trusting you, Lord, to bring people across that breach that exists between you and mankind who is stubborn in his sin. 
I pray for men and women and young people in this service to say yes to Jesus, to come to Jesus and to trust him on this hallowed Christmas Sunday. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.